lot of information and I believe they'll comply with our request. It's very important that they do. We really want to take a look back and we really want to look at a lot of documents to determine um, what went wrong earlier on, if anything went wrong earlier on. And um, so that request is pending and, and we know that they'll be doing their gathering the, the information that we've collected. Uh, we, we want their cooperation as we look in depth at this electronics issue because we're going to go in the weeds on this. People have asked us to do this. We think it's important that we do it. Some people believe that the electronics are a part of the problem and it's our responsibility to really check that out. And so we're going to do that. We need their cooperation in that. I, I don't know that they won't cooperate, I, but uh, and, and, you know, there have been some studies done by some people that they hired, but also by a fellow at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. We want to look at that information. We want to see if they have any information, independent right. of people that they've hired. So we're going we're gonna to continue to really look into that aspect of, uh, of their automobiles. All right. Let me ask you a couple of other things. I, I, I seem to... Have, uh, recall that I read that NHTSA has approximately 700 employees. Is that uh, correct? Yes. Uh, round numbers, that's pretty accurate. Round, uh, and uh, uh, there was some mention about some of this occurring, uh, some of the bad things happening on uh, somebody else's watch, but uh, uh, most of those employees are, are civil service employees, I assume. Are, are, in other words, and most of those employees uh, are still there today that were there. Some of them are, and they're all uh, career people. Right. And, and uh, uh, judging from your earlier testimony, you're pretty satisfied with the response that they made at the time or the investigations that were made at the time and what's been done since you came on board. One of the reasons we made this huge request to Toyota is we want to make sure that when our people put eyes on paperwork prior to this, that we had everything. But I'll tell you this. We have some of the most professional career people. They take their jobs very seriously when it comes to safety because they know what the work they do could save lives and save injuries. But okay. we want to make sure they had all the information. All right. Let me ask you about one other thing. I've heard on the news, and I don't know what the details are, but there apparently was uh, uh, some uh, uh, braggadocio or please, uh, or at least... Uh, uh, happiness by some uh, Toyota engineers or t uh, Toyota employees for getting NHTSA to reduce a, an earlier recall or hold it down to a very small number and they have claimed that they saved uh, uh, Toyota a hundred million dollars or some huge amount of money. Do you know, do you know about that? About well, no, I saw the press reports where they were, Toyota was talking about that and uh but I'll tell you this, Mr. Duncan, we're not going to compromise when it comes to safety. Not on my watch. We just aren't. We're going to hold Toyota's feet to the fire. We're going to get all this information. We're going to make sure that what we looked at before was correct. And if there's new information, then we'll put it out there. But um, uh, so, you know, Toyota made some statements about, you know, saving some money, but it was from my point of view, it will not be at the expense of safety. And these, these earlier reports about uh, uh, NHTSA not having ele electrical engineers or software engineers, you, you said that was uh, untrue and you have plenty of uh, electrical and software engineers. We have are. electrical engineers. We have over 200 engineers uh, total, about 230, right. and we have electrical engineers. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, the gentleman from Tennessee's time has expired. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Illinois, Congressman Quigley. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. Uh, my colleague, Ms. Norton, raised the issues and began discussing the black box issue at some point. Uh, is it true that NHTSA issued a voluntary uh, standard as it relates to black boxes? asking that they be included, that they be used in cars? Um, voluntary 
to have it mandatory if you do have it. Okay. In, for reporting. Okay. In light of what we have learned so far, and perhaps, sir, in light of what we don't know, because you, you mentioned yourself, um, you know, we're not sure it's the electronics or someone's not sure it's electronics. Uh, does it make sense now, given the fact that this information lag is, is dangerous, that we require it? That is something we're looking into. Um, is is the it because of cost? The answer, is it because Mr. Quigley it would take is, a, a lag time? We're going to find out if they should be mandatory or not. We're All looking right. into it. Okay. Well, back to the issue of, of electronics then and whether or not that's an issue. Do, do you or your, the folks who work with you, are they aware that um, the electronics that are used in Toyotas are being, it's the same type of software that's being used in, in all makes of relatively new cars. And if that's the case, uh, to act proactively, shouldn't we be looking at the sum and substance of that software to see if it could be an issue with, with all makes as well? Of course. And well, that's what we're going to do. I said earlier in my testimony, and in response to other questions. We are going to do a comprehensive, complete review on the electronics because people think that it's caused some of these accidents. Members of Congress think that. And we're, we, it's our obligation to check it out, And wh whether it's in Toyota or any other car. Well, have we started talking to uh, other makers about their electronics and the issues they may or may not have had? That, it'll be a we're going to do a comprehensive review. I know what you're going to do, so I'm just asking, have we done that We're so starting far? it. Okay. Have and we done it before? Right. Is that what you're asking me? Yes. We're just starting because of all the complaints that we've heard. Okay. Uh, but we've heard these complaints for how long now? On the electronics, since really the issue of uh, the, the floor mat, we have really started hearing about the electronics when we identified what we thought the problem was. Mm -hmm. And then we issued the three recalls. And so we, we've made a decision to look at the electronics now. Well, what would, your time, what would you suggest your time frame would be to either to get back to us or to the public in terms of your recommendations on the electronics, uh, dealing with other makers, and the issue of whether or not to make the black boxes mandatory? Well, I'll get back to you. I mean, I, I don't know how long this is going to take. It's going to be a complete review, and as you've indicated, it shouldn't just be on Toyotas. It should be on other uh, makes of automobiles that use the same kind of electronics. It, it's going to be a comprehensive study. I'll get back to you for the record on how, when, we can, when, we'll, when our results will be available. I'll, given your answers, what I'll do is I'll close with the following. It just, it seems that we're flying blind. <coughs> You, the, the makers and yourself seem to be saying that we don't know enough. So that information lag would seem to, to at first beg the question that we have the black boxes in all these new cars so that this, this, we don't have to go back and say what happened. We know as it happens immediately. So I, I know you want to review it and think about it, but it seems that the, the key missing ingredient here is what happened and why. And if we had the black boxes, perhaps we'd have a better answer already and we'd be acting quicker to solve these problems. So it just makes sense to me to, to start moving uh, and, and making the, you, you made it voluntary, why not make it mandatory now so that we go forward with more information? I take your point. I yield back. Gentleman from Illinois, thank you very much for your comment. Uh, gentleman from Utah, Congressman Chafee. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Does the government treat Toyota the same as it does all the other automakers? In the last three years, we've had 23 million recalls. The vast majority have not been Toyota. The answer is absolutely correct. Yes. My understanding is that uh, this, the GM Cobalt, which I happen to own, I was surprised after learning this, uh, this information, that the, in February, NHTSA opened an investigation into the steering mechanism in the GM Cobalt based on 1,157 complaints. My understanding is that based on 84 complaints, the model year 2009 uh, Corollas were also opened up. Why, it, two questions. Why did it take NHTSA so long, when we're talking about model year 2005 and 2006 Cobalts, to jump into this fray? And why is there such an apparent discrepancy between the number of, 
of Cobalts versus the number of Corollas. You mean the number of complaints? Yeah. We take every compl 30,000 complaints a year. Every one is taken seriously. We look at every one. We review every one. And we make a judgment call about, about when to start an investigation. Why, why did it take so long? I'll have to get 1,000 complaints. Look, at, I, I, I'll have to get back to you. I don't know the specifics on that, but I want you to know this. Well, Safety one out of every 30 complaints is about it's about this cobalt, according to your stats. So why did it take so long? And what I'll get is back the current to you status? for the record. What is the current status of this? It's under investigation. You, do you honestly believe that Toyota is being held to exactly the same standard as General Motors and everybody else? Absolutely. 100 percent. Is there any sort of interaction with the United Auto Workers and any of part of this whatsoever? Absolutely not. What is the so-called negotiation? I don't understand why a regulatory body involved in the safety and security has to enter into a negotiation with a company. Can you, I, I'm not understanding that term and what that really means. Well, we want to, we want to talk to them. We want to, we need to get information from them. We need to talk to them about what our investigation is about, what we're looking at, what kind of information we need in order to do the good investigation that needs to be done. My understanding is there's a February 5th, 2010 report entitled, quote, Toyota's Sudden Unintended Acceleration uh, Report claimed that NHTSA had an incomplete investiga investigative findings are, quote, certainly the result of insufficient resources. Do you believe that it's common for NHTSA to not be able to go as fully into these problems and challenges because of insufficient resources? Or is it some other reason? We, we have resources. We have, uh, as I said, we have about 125 engineers. We have electrical engineers. I believe we have the resources in the President's budget proposed for 2011. Uh, 66 additional slots would come to NHTSA if that budget were approved by Congress. Well, my understanding is that it's common standard language for NHTSA to say, quote, in the view of if, if a defect petition uh, is denied by NHTSA, to use the language, quote, in view of the need to allocate and prioritize NHTSA's limited resources to best accomplish the agency's safety mission, the petition is denied. Is there a reason that that language is routinely used? I mean, if you're saying that you do have the sufficient resources and, and you're using this statement on a regular basis, they seem to contradict each other. Uh, I, you know what, I'll have to get back to you on that. I, 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 don't, I don't know the reference you're making on that. There's been some anecdotal allegations, and I don't know if they're true, that's why I'm asking the question, that there seems to be a, an increase in the number of attorneys that are going into NHTSA and a decrease in the number of engineers. Can you give me a sense of what's really happening in terms of the balance of the employees? Uh, I'll, I'll put it on the record. How many attorneys versus how many engineers? You, but you, I'm sorry, you don't know the... I don't know the... I want to be accurate because I'm under oath. If you want to know the exact number of lawyers versus the exact number of engineers, I'll put it on the record for you. That would be great. Um, are there any other failures that we see within the system or complaints or concerns by citizens that have been given to NHTSA that are above and beyond the number that we, we saw with, with, with Toyota that have not gone into this category of being recalled or going into some other I would say the one thing which I've already talked about is the electronics. And that's something that, as I said, we, we're going to review that. Because people have come to us, both Toyota uh, drivers and owners and members of Congress, who believe that the electronics are a problem. And we're going to look into that. Do you believe that there's too cozy of a relationship between NHTSA and the industry? And the second part of that question is, no, why would, why would absolutely Toyota, not. But why would Toyota go hire former NHTSA employees if not to just engender a more cozy type of relationship? You'll have to ask the, the employees. There is not a cozy relationship. In the last three years, we've recalled 23 million cars. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Five minutes to the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Mr. Secretary. You've been on both sides of these congressional hearings, so you know what it's like. Way back in October 2007, an enterprising TV journalist in Nashville, Tennessee, for the NBC affiliate, Jeremy Finley, reported on a story about the Toyota Tacoma. 
an unfortunate accident in our area, unexplained circumstances. But unlike most reporters, he dug deeper, and he found 20 cases all over America. He went from Phoenix to Boston. He interviewed former NHTSA head Joan Claybrook, Claybrook, who said, quote, I think that what you have encountered here is a safety defect of significant proportions. He interviewed other experts. In 2008, apparently NHTSA uh, took a quick look, but rapidly closed its investigation telling folks that, quote, in view of the need to allocate and prioritize NHTSA's limited resources to best accomplish the agency's safety mission, the petition is denied. So NHTSA didn't say there wasn't a problem. They basically said they had other more important things to look at. Now, we all know that we want to get to the truth here. Uh, I would urge you and NHTSA to make sure that <clears throat> You're asking Congress for whatever resources you need that you're prioritizing appropriately. And if you could give us assurances that you're looking into all models. I know you're a good person. You inherited a lot of responsibilities. But the public is demanding answers. Can I just uh, read something here, Mr. Cooper? Sure. The Tacoma 2005 through 2010 is subject to the pedal entrapment recall announced in October 2009. The Tacoma is not subject to the sticky pedal recall because it applies only to vehicles that have a certain pedal manufactured by CTS. And the Tacoma was not subject to the floor mat recall in 07 because the evidence, did, was not, the evidence available did not indicate the floor mat was a problem. Uh, we have identified 33 relevant complaints and uh, we, we are uh, as I indicated, uh, though, th those model year are under uh, a recall. Mm -hmm. Well, you know as well as I do that families who own a vehicle may not be expert as to whether it's a pedal entrapment problem or a sticky pedal problem or a floor mat problem. They went on a safe ride for themselves and their families. So we need to be getting about the business of offering safe rides to folks. Another fundamental concern is this. We need a strong safety agency so that they can catch safety problems promptly and save lives. We also need a safety agency that's not captured or beholden to industry so that it has the credibility that once safety problems have been resolved, that people feel comfortable riding in the vehicles again. Because there are a lot of innocent victims both at the front end when lives are lost and at the back end when livelihoods are lost. So, I'm hopeful that we can restore NHTSA's credibility, get to the bottom of this rapidly, and start you know, encouraging commerce again and, and safe rides all over this country. So I appreciate your service, not only in this body, but in the executive branch. And just make sure you ask us for whatever you need to get the job done. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Cong Congressman Flake. I think the chairman. Welcome back. Thank you. Good to, good to see you. I just wanted to follow along the lines that uh, Mr. Chaffetz did, um, talking about whether or not all car companies, domestic and foreign, uh, will be treated equally. And I know you emphatically stated, yes, okay. uh, they are and will be. But he seemed to present some statistics that, that uh, show that at least, I don't know, a body like this shouldn't just accept an emphatic statement, yes, we will. You ought to look at the statistics of complaints no, no. and wonder whether or not that is the case or will be the case. This is likely to cost, uh, this recall, likely to cost Toyota untold billions of dollars. A similar recall of a GM product, for example, would be similar. That cost, because of our investment of taxpayer dollars into this bailout, would reflect on the taxpayers as well. So I don't think it's out of line to, to question and, and at least caution that the Department of Transportation and NHTSA uh, be extremely careful in how they accept and deal with complaints that come in uh, to ensure that, that government isn't taking sides in an area where we have a big investment. And so I, I was just a little bit uh, disturbed by the just emphatic statement, believe me when I say uh, yes, rather than well, if there are statistics that may appear 
to reflect some kind of favoritism, we'll look into that. Is that, do we have a commitment that that is the case and not just saying, yes, we're going to be treated fairly and you should trust us, but we'll look into the statistics on, on complaints and how they're dealt with by NHTSA. Well, Mr. Flake, let me just stipulate, when it comes to safety, there'll be no compromises. There'll be no sweetheart deals. There'll be no cozy relationships. You have my commitment on that, not under my watch. And as I said earlier, if, if you look at any speech I gave last year, it was on safety. No, I Whether understand. it was in planes, trains, or automobiles, it was on safety. That is our obligation to the public. Right. And I don't, I don't, you know, buy this argument that because, you know, the government owns 60 percent of GM that we're going to turn a blind eye to that. That is nonsense. We would never do that. It will never happen under my watch. I guarantee you that. Right. Well, uh, what and I'm look at Mr. Flake, you and I have worked on a lot of issues together. Are. And I understand your commitment. I, I'm just wondering, a lot of this was prior to your entrance there. Um, but, uh, but I guess what I'm looking for is a, a recognition that, hey, on the outside, one could question whether or not government, the federal government, with a in substantial investment of taxpayer dollars, into a couple of domestic uh, automakers might be under a, a pretty high standard here and we ought to look at complaints and, and make sure that we're treating them fairly rather than just saying, yes, we'll treat them fairly. Um, trust me on it. I, I trust you. I may not trust everybody uh, that I don't know, that I haven't seen. And, and uh, I, it goes a lot further, I, I think, with a lot of us uh, to hear, yes, that's something we need to guard against. That's something we need to be absolutely sure of. Because I can tell you, in other areas, uh, government does favor areas, uh, individuals and others, uh, with whom investments are made. That's just the bottom line. That's how governments work. That's human nature. So I, I guess what I'm asking for is just a, a little recognition that that's something that we ought to be concerned about, and we are. So. I recognize that. All right, thank you. Um, would the gentleman yield? I, I would yield. Thank you. Uh, Secretary. You earlier did note <clears throat> the investigation of the cobalt that has been opened. In your opening uh, remarks, first set of remarks, you talked about the uh, members of NHTSA who went to Japan and shortcutted an investigation by saving time and, and money and getting uh, a voluntary cooperation early on based on the end of 2009 trip to Tokyo. Is that right? Yes. So we own 60 percent of General Motors. The cobalt has had far more complaints on a very reminiscently similar problem to where you have a recall on the Corolla. Why aren't we getting that level, or let me rephrase that, are we doing this investigation in the slow road because General Motors is not willing to do what Toyota was willing to do when you, your people went to them last year? Repeat the question. Uh, well, wouldn't it save us money if General Motors would do what Toyota did? and not make you go through the long investigation process on our greater at, look, complaints look and, is, and our majority interest in General Motors. We own 60 percent of them. Ask me a them. question about it. Well, are, are, you willing, are you willing to ask General Motors to cooperate as fully as Toyota did with the Corolla on a car which has had more complaints for a longer period of time? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. The gentleman's time has expired. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Illinois, Congressman Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Secretary. It's good to see you. It's good to see you in this role. And I want to commend you for the stellar job that you've been doing since having been appointed and confirmed. Let me ask you, as you are aware, some believe that the uncontrollable sudden acceleration problems are not being caused by pedal entrapment or sticky pedals, but by an electrical malfunction, either a software problem or electrical interference with some component of Toyota's computer systems. It is my understanding that the Department of Transportation has now launched an investigation into possible electrical interference as a possible cause. Is that correct? Yeah, I would call it more of a very comprehensive review. And at some point, we may get an in, into an investigation, but we're going to do a thorough review and look at, look at everything. 
And, and by that I mean uh, we, we know now as a result of testimony given yesterday there's a fellow at Southern Illinois University who did a study. We want to look at that. We want to look at what Toyota has done. We want to look at all the facts and then determine if, if it, in fact there is a problem. Well, can I ask you, what uh, precipitated or caused you to look at this particular area? Complaints uh, from uh, people that own these cars and uh, also members of Congress who believe there is an electronics problem. It is my understanding that both Toyota and NISTA have examined, examined this issue before. Um, what would be different now? About the I think uh, testimony that was given yesterday before the Commerce Committee where a gentleman from SIU has done a study and he found that there were some problems. We want to look at that. If there's fresh information, if there's new information, we know that Toyota hired some people to do a study. We want to look at that. We want our own engineers to, go back, uh, to look back. Uh, it, look, at, if people think that there's a problem, we should look at that. That's our job to look at it. So you're not really relying upon past examinations, past experiences. You're really starting now? Yeah, we want to take a, put uh, eyes on the fresh information, the well, new information. Let me thank you very much. That gives me some assurance that we are going to do a thorough investigation. I commend you again for the work that you've done, and thank you for Thank PM. you, sir. Thank the gentleman from Illinois. And now you have five minutes to the gentleman from Missouri. Mr. Luca Meyer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you for the frankness of your answers today. Uh, compared to some of the recent uh, witnesses we've had, it's very refreshing. Thank, thank you. you. <clears throat> um, I'm kind of curious. I think, to me, the, the question here is the, uh, the, the protocol or process that you have in place with regards to reviewing 30,000 complaints a year and what raises it to a level that you would uh, start to investigate the floor mat problem, for instance. So can you kind of give me a little overview of your process or your protocols that you sure. have in place with regards to how many, how many uh, complaints do you have to have, how serious do they have to be before they're raised to the level of requesting a recall from the, the manufacturer and kind of walk us through that process so we can see how some of this may have... Well, I mean, yeah. there really isn't... I, I can't give you a number where you say, you know, once you get 25 complaints, that's it. That's the, you know, that's the benchmark. It depends. I mean, uh, the gentleman from Utah was questioning why it took 1,300 one place and a lesser number in another place. And it's, it's the seriousness of the complaint. It's our people who are experts really looking at these, driving the, uh, looking at the research, talking to the people that own the automobile, talking to the car manufacturer, and really trying to discover if there's a serious uh, flaw or defect or something wrong. And so it's, more it's individualized. a judgment call. It's more individualized based on the, the particular incident that you're That's investigating. That's right. Is there, is there a certain uh, number of And if of there's a commonality, so? say yeah. that, you know, okay. there's 100 complaints and they're all about the same thing, yeah. then obviously that's probably a, an issue that we need to look at. I know uh, a couple of members were talking about trying to bring into the uh, investigation information from other parts of the world. Uh, have you done that at all with, with any recent investigations? We do that. Do I you? mean, we try okay. and get information from the foreign car manufacturers in other places in the world. We, we get the, try and get the, we look at it and see what it says. I know that you've mentioned that you're going to get or looking to try and get some more engineers on, on, your, on your watch here. And one of the things that the uh, folks at Toyota have made a comment about uh, is that uh, they believe, and the comment was, the new team has less understanding of engineering issues and are more focused on primary legal issues. Do you think that's a fair statement or is that the necessi no, uh, necessity for more is, engineers? Is the statement that engineers are working on legal issues? Is that what that said? No, I, what they're trying to say is that uh, your focus is more on the legal part of it versus the actual engineering part where the problem really is. I, I mean, I don't buy that argument, but, yeah. uh, you know, if you want me to get you some statistics on it, I, I can do that for the record. But look at our, our, they're, they're, actually, they're actually making an argument for more, for more engineers for you. This well, <laughs> the president put in our budget right. 66 new positions, and, and we think that, that th that'll be a good resource for us. And I think, quite frankly, I think a point needs to be made here as well, that a lot of the problems that we're dealing with today with regards to Toyota is their engineering versus the quality of the vehicle itself. Uh, I think that, you know, the, the, the manufacturing and the, the quality of the parts the, on, the, on a vehicle are, are not in question here. It's the engineering of these parts that cause some of the problems to happen. So um, 
I guess one more uh, question that I have with regards to all of this, when you're starting to investigate, do you bring in outside experts as well uh, to try and work on these issues? In other words, if you uh, have an issue you're not, cons not, not, your engineers are not capable Absolutely. of doing, or actuarially you're not sure about where this, where do you go to get that information? What experts do you go to? We, we go to people on the outside who are expert uh, electrical engineers or mechanical engineers or, the, you know, we find, look, at there are a lot of good people around America who can provide expertise and we're not bashful about doing that if we don't think we have it in-house. Do you make recommendations to the manufacturer on how to rectify a situation or do you leave them up to them to come with We to, leave to it up to, to them and we don't sign off on it. They mm -hmm. come to us and say, oh, well, here, here's, mm -hmm. we think this is the fix, and, but we don't put our stamp on it, but we make sure that they really believe this is the fix. Mr. Secretary, I appreciate your comments thank today you. and thank you. I'll go back to the mouse of my time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Virginia, Congressman Connolly. With the uh, consent of the Chairman and the Committee, I would like to yield my time to Mr. Lynch, who has a pressing engagement, and reclaim my time at the appropriate Without moment. objection. Okay. Uh, thank you, Congressman Conley. I appreciate the courtesy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Good to see you. Uh, I have, uh, we have the advantage in Congress of being able to look at things forensically after they happen, and you have the unfortunate uh, disability that you have to make decisions as they, as they occur and I understand that difficulty. But I, I do want to say that looking at this forensically, uh, first we had Toyota come out with the recall regarding the floor mats. All right, so I, I just think that, that that's a red herring, and, I, and I, I, I'm not sure that all of these problems are from somebody's floor mat. I think it's easily understood. It's somewhat user-controlled. The second excuse was this uh, very simplistic sounding sticky gas pedal, trying to make it sound very innocent and, you know, now we've got uh, electronic interference, uh, somewhat external, I guess, uh, as, as the nature of the problem. And it just sounds like the, the, the problems are getting, or at least the solutions are getting more complicated as we go forward, more expensive, uh, more pernicious. And uh, I happen to read something by Steve Wozniak, uh, the co-founder of Apple, and uh, he's, got, he's got a bunch of Priuses, but uh, his most recent one is not one of the ones that was subject to the, uh, any of the recalls. And uh, he says, uh, I have many models of the Prius that got recalled, but I have a new model that didn't get recalled. And this is a fellow who says a, a lot of things don't bother him in life except for computers that don't work and uh, don't work right. And uh, he says, this new model has an accelerator that goes wild, but only under certain conditions of cruise control, and I can repeat this over and over again safely. He said, this is software. It's not a bad accelerator pedal. It's very scary, but luckily for me, he says, I can hit the brakes. Uh, now, here's my problem, Mr. Secretary. My dealers are working night and day right now, my Toyota dealers, to fix the mats, the floor mats, the sticky pedal, they're going through these fixes. One of my dealers I talked to yesterday doing 175 fixes per day. He's got all his people working. And, and I appreciate that. There's a real effort. But I'm one of these members of Congress who thinks that this is a software problem. And if we're bringing people in and fixing their sticky pedal or fixing their floor mat and sending them back out on the road with the assurance that their car is fixed, we're sort of creating a, 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 you know, a moral hazard here, a, a situation that we're telling people that they have the reassurance now because we have fixed it. But if this is still the problem that you're, you're, you're investigating uh, and beginning to investigate, then we're making the problem more, more dangerous. And I'm, I'm just concerned that that's the phenomenon we've got here, that this is at root a software problem, something much more complex, something much more pernicious, something tougher to get rid of, and, and we're, we're playing with this by telling people, well, we're going to change your floor mat or we're going to, you know, we're going to oil your sticky pedal here and you'll be okay. So how do we get at that? Well, as you can imagine, uh, Mr. Lynch, I mean, w we have to base our judgments on research and on good data and making sure we know what we're talking about. When, people, when we say something, people listen to us. Hopefully. 
And until we do the complete review, the comprehensive review, look at all these things, we're not about to say something where it's just not accurate. You know, just for the point of... Well, you, you might be doing that already is what I'm getting at. If you're telling people it's a problem with the floor mat, and it's not, are you telling people they, well, it's Mr. a sticky Lynch, pedal, the, and it's look not... At, look, at, I don't agree with you. I mean, we wouldn't have told people to change out these floor mats if we didn't think it. our research showed that was a problem. We can prove that. We can prove the sticky pedal was a problem. We can prove it. Now, so to say that that's not accurate is... It belies all of the facts that we have, and we wouldn't be saying these things if it weren't true. Well, I, I just think that we have to consider the fact that there, there very well could be a, a serious uh, software problem here. And again, I, I, think, I think we're in a very awkward position if we're telling people that changing out your floor mat is going to fix this. Or, or the sticky pedal solution is going to fix this, and, and yet we're sending people out in dangerous automobiles. I'm just saying you've got to, you've got to weigh that in with the course of your, your investigation and the urgency with which you're investigating these, these more uh, uh, complicated or, or complex uh, problems. I take your point. I yield back. Thank you. Right. Gentlemen's time has expired. And I recognize uh, the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Fortenbury. Mr. Secretary, welcome. Uh, it's always my hope that uh, congressional hearings have some sort of constructive outcome. And in that regard, it was discussed earlier, I believe, by Mr. Issa, that uh, a more transparent international marketplace for safety data sharing would be appropriate. In that regard as well, given that uh, today's hearing is about Toyota safety problems and particularly this unintended acceleration problem which you've committed to continuing to research and work through, this has happened though across other car manufacturers, two other car manufacturers from the data that I see. Has there in, been any discussion about developing some type of consortium uh, and perhaps in partnership with NHTSA? that would actually work uh, toward uh, a comprehensive evaluation of this uh, so that there could be even broader safety outcomes uh, for the public? Well, we try and do these things, uh, you know, based on the complaints that we hear from people. We do these, conduct this these investigations. This gets out of our boxes, though. This, gets, this is a policy consideration. Pardon me? This is a policy consideration. Yeah, well, a potential change. Look, of I, I'll, I'll be willing to look at it, but I mean, it doesn't fit into the uh, what, what we're doing now. Should it? I think it's something we can look at. Look, I, I get lots of good ideas from coming to these hearings, and it's something that you know I'd be happy to to visit with you about and and sure. and, and see. I, I mean, I I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it's something we're going to do because I, I I don't know enough about what you're you're trying to purport here, but I, I'm willing to talk to you about it. Uh, again, what I said at the beginning, looking for constructive outcomes. That's Absolutely. the purity of my intention, is to maybe think creatively a lot alike the, uh, about this, because right now our attention has shifted to Toyota and appropriately trying to get to the bottom of these public safety issues. But again, given that this has happened across the industry, is there an opportunity here to think more creatively policy-wise about a common fix? Uh, using the resources that we have, that what a consortium, again, that could look at this in partnership with the government to, again, improve or, or make the safety outcomes of this hearing and what you're doing even sure. broader applicably. That, that's just the, I got, the policy I, idea I put in front of you. I got you. Okay. That's all I had. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to yield the additional time that I have to Mr. Issa. Uh, you know, I'll be quick, and then Mr. Burton would like to ask a quick question. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, you, you said that it depends on when you evaluate something how, how significant it is. But under the current system, the manufacturer doesn't give you every single complaint that occurs. So you are evaluating some and missing others. If there's a sticky pedal like this one in Great Britain and there's some reports, unless there's a recall, you don't see it at all. Do you think that should change? Well, look, when we go to the manufacturer and we ask them for information about complaints they've had about their 
their vehicles. We hope they're going to be forthright with us. I mean, part of the process. No, I appreciate that, Mr. Secretary, but the current law, they only have to tell you if there's a recall. Do you believe that it should change to where all information on like models worldwide I think the more information, be the better. Okay. Would, do you have the authority to ask for that and receive it from the manufacturers, or do you need authority from Congress? We, 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 have the, we ask the manufacturers when we get complaints about certain aspect, mechanical aspects, and we assume they're being forthright with us. Thank you. Mr. Fortenberry, Mr. 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 Fortenberry controls it. Right, I was telling you. I, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield the remaining time to Mr. Burton. Uh, let me just, uh, Mr. Secretary, this floor mechanism was made in Japan, and there hasn't been any problem with it. And this one was made in the United States. They both work on the same car. And this one is the one that they've had all the problems with. And they had to put a they had to put a, a shim in, so that there was proper clearance, so it wouldn't uh, it wouldn't uh, uh, stick. And my question is, why is it in the same car you have two different mechanisms, and one's causing the problem and one isn't? It seems to me that Toyota uh, evidently knew that there was a problem, maybe with one and not the other. And and this one was used in Japan and Europe. And this one was used in the United States, and this is the one that's caused the problem. Now, he just asked you a question about whether you have the authority. It seems if there's a problem any place in the world, uh, your agency ought to be able to get that information and, or demand that information so that you can look at a recall uh, here in the United States, even if it happened over in, 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 in Europe someplace. And I'd like for, for you maybe to ask, and I'm going to ask the president of Toyota about this today, why there has this difference. So would the gentleman yield? We have uh, his yes, time. He, Mr. Fort, no, 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 Mr. Fort, no, no, Mr. Fortenberry Mr. Fort controls uh, the time. Will the gentleman yield? I yield yeah. the remaining time, Mr. Souter. The, yeah. Actually, the time has expired. <laughs> Thank you. The, there needs to be a. There needs Sorry, to be a. The time is. The gentleman's time, time is. A gentleman's time point, has expired. Point of order. The gentleman made a a a uh, somewhat factual misstatement about a manufacturer in Indiana. And I think it's important to, to clarify the record because we, we, we went through this once earlier. The sticky pedal, which you said correctly, the one that had a slow return, but the secretary testified that the slow return didn't have any of the deaths with it. It was the Japanese part that had the deaths. They did have to put that thing in, but there, there are two distinct things that happened with that pedal. And it's important that the record show that the American part as we already established, did not cause the deaths. Let, let the gentleman know that um, uh, Mr. Toyota will be testifying later on, so I think that's an appropriate question that could be raised with him. Uh, now we recognize the gentleman from Texas, Congressman Cuellar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, Secretary, it's good seeing you again. I think last time we saw each other was in San Antonio. It's a pleasure. I have a uh, uh, an overhead that I would ask the staff to uh, put on, and I'm going to ask your, um, your thoughts on, on this uh, particular. It has to do with the uh, percentage of vehicles affected by safety recalls from two th 2001 to uh, 2010. And I would ask you to take a look at that, Mr. Secretary, and, and just give me your thoughts on that uh, once they make it big enough so you can go ahead and, and, uh, and look at that. Uh, Mr. Secretary, and, and I guess what I'm looking at, I do have, um, around my area, I do have the uh, San Antonio plant uh, there where 2,600 employees depend on the work that you do as the enforcement and regulator and, of course, what Toyota is going to do. That doesn't even include the on-site suppliers where you add another amount and it adds about 5,500 local jobs in our area. It doesn't include the dealers, doesn't include that. So there's a lot of folks that are depending on what we're doing, uh, what you all are doing, and of course, you know, jobs, and of course, making sure that the drivers are safe. And if you can look at that, I think you see Toyota, if you can read that, Mr. Uh, Mr. Secretary, about 11%. And my question is, and I know you, you just got in about a little bit over a year ago, but from your understanding over the past decade, what are we doing to respond to the recalls of other car makers in this particular graph? I mean, anything different that we're doing now? When we, when we believe that there needs to be a recall, uh, we notify uh, the manufacturer and, um, 
and, and then uh, the recall takes place. And as I said, over the last three years, 23 million cars have been recalled. And the vast majority of them have not been Toyota. Mm -hmm. I can't read that chart, Mr. Cuellar, but if you want to... Um, well, there's a, a company at 32 percent. This is from percentage of vehicles affected by safety recalls from 20 from 2001 to 2010, the last 10 years. Okay. You have one company, the, the one at 32 percent, another company at 17 percent, another company at 15 percent, uh, and then you have others, a, a combination of other companies, and then you have Toyota at 11 percent. Okay. And this is, again, using NHTSA's uh, recall database list right. uh, from y'all. So right. I say that, uh, members, just so we can look at the overall picture right. of what we're looking at, number one. Number two is I'm looking at your budget, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Secretary, the uh, FY 2011, um, and you've been a legislator, and I, I guess I'm asking your thoughts. Uh, anything you think we ought to do on the budget uh, to improve it? I know it's your budget. I think I know what your answer is going to be. And, of course, any legislative responses that we ought to look at. And if you say budget should stay that amount, no legislative changes, then what should we do differently to make sure that we protect uh, our drivers and, and make sure we provide that safety and that make sure that car companies, in this case Toyota, make sure that they respond as quickly as possible. <laughs> well, to I think uh, some of the things that um, Mr. Issa mentioned as far as uh, information, uh, we, we may want to work with all of you on, uh, on our ability to get information worldwide and, um, you know, if we may have some thoughts on that. Uh, with respect to our budget, we're grateful to the President uh, for including 66 new positions. We can use those human resources and uh, experts to, uh, to help us do our work. Okay. Now, let me ask you this, Mr. Secretary. I understand that NHTSA took a trip to Japan to meet with top officials to press the seriousness of the safety issues. You noted that it was because of that trip that the actions were made uh, because of the recalls. And I, I guess I have two questions. What measures did you take before NHTSA made the trip to Japan to discuss the seriousness of these issues? Number one, and then I have a follow-up. Yeah, we, we had uh, several meetings with uh, North America Toyota, and, and I want to stipulate that these are very professional, good people who take their jobs very seriously. And... Um, we, we met with them and talked with them several times about uh, the issues that we felt uh, were causing these, uh, their vehicles to uh, malfunction. Okay. Mr. Secretary, why travel to Japan? I mean, I know that there's a different hierarchy in the company. I understand that. But talking to Toyota USA, wouldn't that be sufficient? Or, or was there a necessity? Apparently, it looked like there was a necessity to travel to Japan. Why well, I mean, Mr. Uh, Lenz, the CEO of Toyota in North America, stipulated yesterday at the hearing that he testified at that a lot of decisions are made in Japan. And when we determined that we needed to go to the people who were making the decisions so they understood that these are serious safety concerns and that we were going to take uh, some pretty uh, significant action, we wanted to go to the people that were making the decisions. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, gentleman yields back. Uh, Mr. Jordan of Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Dr Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, thank you for joining us uh, today. I have, I think, just three quick, uh, three quick questions. Let me go first to this concern I think was raised earlier by my colleague from Utah and, and our colleagues from Utah and Arizona about, you know, this, this idea of the government majority owner in General Motors and Chrysler, and yet also the regulator um, of the competitors of those two, two companies. Are there or have you or has NHTSA put any specific safeguards, any specific protocols in place, again, just, just to ensure impartial treatment when you're evaluating recalls and complaints you receive? Um, from, from any, any car manufacturer? Do you know of like specific things you've done, specific protocols, specific safeguards that have been enacted? Have we put any safeguards in our relationship with companies other than Toyota? Is that what you're asking me? I'm just saying, you know, just, just this perception that here we have 
the taxpayers, the majority owner of, of General Motors and, and uh, the government, the majority owner. So General you're Motors asking me just about those two companies then? Any safeguards, GM or Chrysler, right? Exactly. Uh, we've put no safeguards in. We don't have to. Safety is our number one priority. When safety is our number one priority, it's not going to be compromised by any kind of relationship we have with anybody. Never has been, never will be. Okay, let me ask you along those same lines, have, um, in regarding specifically the Toyota recall situation, has anyone from General Motors contacted you about the Toyota recall situation? You know, I'll, I'll have to check, but I, not that I know of, but I, I don't, you know, since I'm, you know, I want to be accurate on these things, and I know this information is important to you, and I, I will has personally anyone? let you know, but I don't think so. How about anyone from Chrysler? Not that I know of. Anyone from the United Auto Workers? No, sir. Has anyone, specifically Ron Bloom or anyone else from the Auto Task Force, contacted you regarding the Toyota recall situation? No, sir. Okay, last question then, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Earlier you said, uh, Mr. Secretary, every Toyota car listed on the NHTSA recall website <clears throat> is, um, is unsafe. Is that just, is that statement accurate only about Toyota, or does that mean any car listed on, from any company on, on a recall website list? Any is car, it, any company on our website okay. that's listed for recall should be taken to the dealer so it can be made safe. Okay. Uh, let me go back one, if I could, uh, Mr. Chairman, one other. Back to um, any contact. Do you know if anyone at... I ask you if you've been contacted. Do you know if anyone from NHTSA has been contacted by General Motors, Chrysler? I'll ha uh, you know what? I'll have to get back to you for the record. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We, right. we, we have lots of employees at NHTSA. There's no way I would know that. But I'll, I'll, I'll check it out and I'll let you know. All right. Uh, I would yield uh, the remaining time to uh, Mr. Rice. Mr. Secretary, this is within your scope, even though it clearly is not something that uh, anyone's going to say you, you could have taken care of immediately, but are you aware of any studies that show us out of these 23 million recalls during that decade, how many cars got fixed? How many cars had I'll, the... I'll, I'll just, I'll have to put that on the record for okay. you. It was the last, the 23 million is the last three years, okay. not the decade. Okay. Of these 23 million, if you have or can get or can have a study done, to let this committee know, out of 23 million cars that are unsafe, as, as Ralph Nader said, you know, unsafe at any speed, well, unsafe on the highway, there are 23 million cars. If, let's say, only 20 percent of them had their recalls applied, I don't think that's going to happen with Toyota, but it may happen with other less publicized recalls, then we have 90 percent of those 23 million unsafe and on the highway. Would you commit to us to find out how effective recalls are, what percentage actually get applied, and as a result, how many cars are unsafe, in your opinion, my opinion, I suspect the Chairman's opinion, so that we can evaluate whether or not better advertising or better compliance needs to occur. Of course, we will get you the information, Mr. Issa, but we're a little bit busy right now, too, so I, don't, I hope you're not going to stipulate we do it within the next 24 or 48 hours. Of course Our not, Mr. Secretary, I, although if you need more resources, <laughs> just ask. <laughs> Our people are very busy, but we, of course, we will provide you the information. Uh, and, Mr. Mr. Uh, Chairman, if just one piece of patience. I'm presuming that all it takes to get this information would be to contact the top 11 manufacturers and ask them to provide it since they have it and you said they, they give you what you asked for. With that, I yield back to the gentleman. Gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize the gentlewoman from California, Congresswoman Chu. Secretary LaHood, uh, congratulations on being confirmed um, as Secretary of Transportation. Uh, I have a question about um, the pattern of behavior at NHTSA that may have occurred before you got there. And it leads some to wonder, NHTSA is supposed to be a watchdog, but has it instead become a lapdog? And in fact, some people believe that NHTSA has become too dependent on the manufacturers that it regulates to cooperate with the agency and volunteer information about what might be going wrong with a particular vehicle. 
while NHTSA sends letters asking for this information, it rarely uses a subpoena, which would be far superior in that it would require a full and complete response under threat of criminal penalties. Do you believe that NHTSA is aggressive enough in seeking information that it needs to keep the public safe? Uh, I believe that we have been very aggressive. And if we need to use subpoena, we'll use it. But uh, we, we have lots of enforcement mechanisms. And I would also st stipulate, uh, on my watch, we've been a lapdog for nobody. We've been a lapdog for the people who drive cars and want to do them safely. That's who we've been a lapdog for. Safety is our number one priority. I've been in this job since January 23rd, 09. I'm not a lapdog for anybody, and none of our employees are either. But we have good enforcement mechanisms, and we use them. And if we can't get the information, we, we have the opportunity to subpoena. Well, if I could follow up. Um, according to testimony that's going to be provided later by a former NHTSA administrator, the agency imposed no penalties from 2004 to 2008, and the largest penalty that the agency has ever imposed is $1 million. The TRED Act of 2000 now authorizes much higher penalties. What would explain the lack of penalties that NHTSA has imposed in the last several years? I'll have to get back to you for the record on that. That was prior to my stewardship of this agency. But I'll put that on the record for you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Gentleman, gentlewoman, yield back. Yes, I yield back. Yeah. I now recognize the gentleman from California for five minutes, Congressman Bill Bray. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, first of all, congratulations. I'm glad to see a fellow classmate serving the nation in a different set. But I, I can't think of a better choice that the President could have made. And so I'm glad to see you there. Thank you. I, I uh, happen to drive one of these vehicles, hopefully safely, and we'll correct whatever we need to do. But in San Diego, we ended up having this incident where a highway patrolman driving his wife, his child, and his brother-in-law ended up uh, basically dying because of the mad issue. When I look down at this list, I'm wondering, though, from a observation from a distance, that could have the reputation of Toyota actually been a contributing factor in um, how this process was handled. Uh, some may not know, know, but Toyota is ranked at the absolute top, a second only maybe to Mercedes and, and Porsche for, for satisfaction, for reputation. And I guess if you drive a Porsche, you darn well better be happy with the vehicle um, if you've paid for it. But is it possible? that in this process, the great reputation of dependability and safety that Toyota has created over the last 30 years created an inadvertent prejudice for, against more strict review because everybody always assumed in the last 20 years, and let me just stop and say, 10 years from now, I mean, 10 years ago, if you and I would have said we would be here talking about Toyota, most of us would have said you're crazy. Hugo, maybe. You might have been talking about General Motors, but we never would have thought it would have been Toyota. Could have that inherent institutional prejudice, and I'm not saying just to the agency, but to society as a whole, could have we created a situation where maybe there wasn't as critical review up front on Toyota that might have been done if it was a Hugo or if it was General Motors? Well, not in my opinion, Mr. Bill Bray. I'm, I'm, you know, I've, I've been in this job 13 months. I've worked with the, the people at NHTSA. They're, they're a lot, almost all of them are career people. They, they take their jobs very seriously because it does involve safety. Uh, and I, I don't think that's the case. Okay, I appreciate that. The, um, in 07, um, there was, there was an investigated investigation conducted about the mats. Um, it appeared that that investigation or the outcome of that investigation didn't reflect what we now believe should have been the proper observation. It wasn't until the deaths in my county and Daryl Issa's county that it really raised it the concern last year when we had the crash again with the all with the mats again showing up. 
how do we have this investigation 07 review all of these models, pull back on a lot of models, and then still end up with a situation where by 09 people are dying in the streets of San Diego County? Well, it's obvious that uh, to us that when that crash occurred, that highlighted again uh, the floor mat problem that was determined to be what caused the accident and, um, and that was the issue. And we also, looking back, realized that people really weren't taking their cars in that had floor mat problems. And so we re-engaged Toyota to ask, ask for another mailing to their customers with, so that they could um, bring them in and have the floor mats replaced. And uh, then that led to the investigation of the sticky pedal and the result of the uh, determination that that needed to be fixed also. Well, in all fairness, Mr. Secretary, uh, when we talk about the format issue, we're talking about the all-weather the all weather mat, and we're talking about, in this case, in San Diego's deaths, it was not an owner who didn't bring it in. This was actually a dealership vehicle that still had the, the mats in place. And so there seems to be a big disconnect between what we said we wanted done and what was actually down in the field. And I think that, in, in all fairness, this one shows that it wasn't just the fact that those of us who drive Toyotas didn't take the recall notice um, seriously. Would, um, frankly, wasn't even, I wasn't even aware as a consumer that it, the all-weather was specifically uh, targeted here until I, as a member of this committee, know that. Doesn't that tell you that we have a major gap between the way the system ought to work and the way it's actually working? I would admit that there is a disconnect sometimes between wh whether people get the information and, and, um, and, and whether they take it seriously and how it's disseminated. Um, I think that's an issue. I agree with that. Thank the gentleman's you. time has expired. I now recognize the gentlewoman from California, Congresswoman Watson. Secretary LaHood, congratulations. I've enjoyed your straightforward responses. Thank you. And <laughs> no. That's a, a serious Thank commendation. Uh, in response to consumer complaints that have come in uh, as early as 2003, uh, NHTSA launched the first of eight separate investigations into sudden unintended acceleration. And three of these investigations concluded that it was the floor mat. And I had the people from Toyota in my office yesterday and they showed me the floor mat and so on and so forth. Easy to fix, just shorten the floor mat and so on. What I'm hearing through the media, it's really in the computer system. Uh, can you tell me um, what you have learned that might be helpful to us that we can relate to our constituents who have Toyotas? We, uh, we are gonna do a complete review of the electronics to determine if that is part of the reason that some of these vehicles have uh, accelerated or decelerated. Uh, we've heard from enough members of Congress about this, and we've heard from enough drivers of these vehicles that they think it's an issue, and we're going to look into it. And we're uh, going to look at information that was provided yesterday to the uh, Energy Committee, the Commerce Committee. Uh, by people who've done some studies. We're going to look at some studies that Toyota have done, and we're going to talk to experts about this. Thank you so much for that response, because I do think it bears looking into, and I shared that with the Toyota people when they came. I said, you've got to clarify this particular flaw that seems to be very prevalent. Um, I've read that in Mrs. Claybrook's prepared testimony, she stated that NHTSA statute should be changed to add criminal penalties uh, for complaints or uh, for companies who knowingly and willfully <laughs> refuse to initiate a recall <laughs> to correct safety defects. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Ms. Watson, I, I really haven't thought enough about that to render an opinion. I've, I've seen what uh, Joan Claybrook has said about that, and uh, I'd rather not really venture a, a guess on that at the moment, or, or an opinion, excuse me. 
So if uh, we find it's necessary, would you work on a provision to? We, we are, the information that we've requested from Toyota, which is voluminous, is a part of what we're trying to determine whether there should be some civil penalties. Thank you. And uh, in your testimony, you described the lengthy process that must be undertaken for your agency to order recall. As a result, consumers are offered protection that uh, the fast uh, protection and uh, the fastest when manufacturers voluntary initiate uh, recalls. While some of the experiences with Toyota have fortunately been voluntary recalls because of pressure applied by NHTSA, do you think the process for NHTSA to auto recall could be made more efficient? And I heard you say that, you know, if you had the employees, if the money was there, so yeah. you want to elaborate on that? I think we should always look at efficiencies. I think if there's a better way to do these things, I, I'm, I'm not opposed to doing that. And uh, if uh, people around here think that there's a, a better way to do it, we're willing to listen to them. But uh, the system as it exists now, I think, has worked pretty well. But I'm not opposed to doing something more efficiently. It's been reported that there has been some negotiations between uh, Toyota and, I guess, NHTSA on whether or not uh, the recall, the numbers of recalls should be capped and so on. Can you give us more information? Not on, on my watch, Ms. Watson. We, uh, we've taken this work very seriously and uh, uh, we do what we think is the best interest of the, the, the people that own these automobiles, particularly as it relates to safety. Well, I wish you well. This Thank is you. a turbulent time for your agency. I understand that. Yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I now recognize the gentleman from uh, Virginia, Congressman Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I know it's been a long day, uh, Mr. Secretary, and I, I didn't have the privilege of serving with you here in the House, but I'm so glad you are where you are. And I want to thank you uh, for one of the first things you did as our new Secretary of Transportation was sign the full funding grant agreement for Rail to Dulles. Very important project. Thank you so much for your leadership and your support on that. I'm going to ask you a series of questions that are in the category of what do we know and when do we know it. And I understand that most of those answers are probably going to precede your tenure. So I'm asking you to the best of your knowledge, given your current position, uh, what do we know and when do we know it. Um, uh, to the best of your knowledge, Mr. Secretary, when did we first learn, we, the federal government, your agency, NHTSA, first learned there was a problem that merited further examination with respect to the acceleration of Toyota vehicles? Well, I'll get you the exact year, but it was uh, a few years ago. I, I'll, I'll just, you know, for the record, I'm going to, I want to be accurate about these things. You know, I just don't want to speculate. I could pour over my papers here and get you the answer, but I don't want to waste your time. I, it's better for me to just do it for the record. That's fine. Um, Mr. Secretary, do you know how many wrongful death lawsuits have been filed with respect to the accelerator problem? I do not, but I'll, I'll, I'll find out. And when they were first filed, that would be very okay. helpful. Um, you're in the predecessor administration. NHTSA officials flew to Tokyo to meet with Toyota about this problem. Is that not correct? Uh, that was under uh, my watch. That was under your watch. Yes, it was. That, that occurred last year. And can you describe for us the nature of that, those conversations? It was a very, very frank conversation about safety matters that we felt they needed to address. And they began to address them after that meeting occurred. I also had a telephone conversation personally with Mr. Toyota and talked to him about the seriousness of the matter that we were addressing. And did you find, could you characterize a little bit uh, Toyota's reaction to the seriousness I think, they, with I think they realized that it was a serious situation and that we were not going to countenance any kind of uh, delay in really addressing it. And do you feel that the company from your perch has in fact responded in a timely and effective After our visit to Japan and after my phone call with Mr. Toyota, yes. One of the criticisms one has heard from consumers um, was that they were, in fact, lodging complaints with the company. 
and, uh, and, and were kind of being dismissed. And in retrospect, do you believe Toyota could have or should have maybe taken those cons early warning consumer complaints more seriously? And part two, might it have made a difference in terms of where we are today? I'd really only be speculating on that. I, I, I just, um, I can only tell you about our involvement and I think that maybe is a better question for Mr. Toyota. NHTSA falls in your domain. Yes. Um, and as you have said multiple times in this hearing, safety is our number one priority. Yes. Presumably the SOPs, the, the uh, standard operating procedures for NHTSA are that alarm bells go off when we learn about, even anecdotally, uh, the acceleration, the, the involuntary acceleration of a vehicle, let alone uh, anecdotal information that, that would suggest people have actually lost their lives because of it. We have to certainly at least look into it. Absolutely. How, uh, what grades would you give NHTSA in the past in responding with alacrity to those anecdotal reports and what have we learned moving forward in the future to improve our performance? Under my government? watch, I, we've taken all of these things very seriously. We really have. This and the previous no watch? Pardon me? And the previous watch. Well, I, I mean, I, 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 I'll get back to you on the record on that. I mean, uh, look, at some things uh, have taken place that uh, maybe should have been done more expeditiously. Gentlemen's time is expired. I thank the chair and I thank the secretary. Thank you very much. Uh, I now yield to the gentleman from uh, Louisiana, Mr. Chow. Mr. Secretary, um, actually, I don't have any questions. Just to have a, uh, a statement. Okay. And uh, just to um, sincerely thank you for uh, everything you have done for uh, for Louisiana, especially for the second district. I know that you've worked very hard uh, in your capacity as a secretary to address all of the transportation issues uh, of the country. Uh, but uh, on behalf of my constituents, um, I just want to thank you for your visit and thank you for everything that you've done uh, for us. Uh, and that's all I really have, because I'm pretty you. sure you've been under hours of questioning already. So Thank, thank you very you. much. Mr. Ch Mr. Ch Mr. Ch Mr. Secretary, you don't get that too much around here. <laughs> I appreciate I you, it. I want you to know. <laughs> I appreciate it when I hear it, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you. I now yield to the gentlewoman from uh, New York, uh, Congresswoman Maloney. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I first would like to uh, welcome my colleague and very good friend and thank him for his public service in the Hall in House of Representatives and now, now at Transportation. Uh, I, I, I'd just like to ask a broad question, uh, and how did we get to this place? Uh, Toyota had a, a good reputation. Uh, your department has a good reputation. Yet the field technical reports uh, from the company in Europe show that they knew about this problem and were reporting that there were problems uh, a year ago. Why didn't they bring this to your attention? Uh, I'm just saying, reading from the field, this, this, I'm reading from the field report. This is an internal document from Toyota. This brings the number of reported cases in the FTR to 38. Um, the customer has stated uh, about the sticky deal and the, the problem with the acceleration. And so they, they knew about it in Europe, and yet why is the communication did not work to get to you that this was a problem to get to American dealers that this was a problem. Can you give an overall assessment of what went wrong and therefore give us a guide to what we need to do in the future for the safety of American citizens and all citizens? My assessment of this, um, Mrs. Maloney, is this. Two things, really. I think the business model that Toyota has used where they have some really, really good, professional, capable people in North America running the company, without the kind of opportunity for decision making. So then decisions are made in Japan. And I think the second part of it is, well, the, I, first of all, I don't know if that b business model, I think it's failed them in this instance. And I think the other part of it is, some people in Toyota, and I've said this before, this is not anything new,
became a little safety deaf. Mm -hmm. and, and specifically, how did the business model fail? They weren't communicating? No, it's not, it's not that they, it's, it's, the information was being passed, mm -hmm. but then the decisions that I think and the outcomes that people wanted in North America weren't always mm -hmm. complied with. Well, well, getting uh, back to the sudden acceleration events, uh, you testified that uh, consumers, if they feel they have a problem, they go to their, their dealer and they correct it. And how do you know that it's been corrected? And how do you know that was the problem? Did you do any independent analysis or did anyone do any in independent analysis of the problem and how to fix it? And how does a consumer know once it has gone back to the uh, company to be corrected that it is in fact corrected? Well, we, we uh, as a part of our investigations, uh, we ask the, the companies to uh, fix the problem and present that information to us. And again, we don't sign on the dotted line and say, you know, we agree or disagree, but if, if they believe based on all the information <clears throat> excuse me, all the information we've presented them, that they think this is the fix, uh, then that process gets carried over uh, to the customer. And in, I think, many instances, the fix has worked. Well, later on there will be a, a witness who was a former employee of, of your department or uh, of transportation, and uh, she testifies that, from reading her testimony, um, that the, the NHTSA administrators did not adequately investigate the many problems. Now, this was before you took the helm. Uh, so the staff has literally shown us in preparing for this hearing th that there were literally thousands of complaints of sudden unintended acceleration, yet it doesn't appear that any meaningful action was taken until the Sailor family crashed. And um, my question is, why did it take so long? Again, we're talking about complaints that, that by some reports started coming in in, in 2004. Well, we did, uh, we did work with Toyota on a fix on the floor mat, uh, and they put out a recall so that those floor mats could be removed. Uh, there's a recall on the sticky pedal, and uh, those are up on the website, and, and if people take their cars in, Toyota will fix those. And uh, so... Uh, you know, people have to be made aware of it, either by notice or looking on the website or by concern or media reports or whatever. And um, not everyone has taken their car back, but we encourage people, if you're having a problem with your car, take it to your Toyota dealer. And uh, since safety is our number one concern, as you so properly stated uh, from your agency, have you considered asking uh, your inspector general to audit or examine the prior investigations to, to determine if they were sufficiently robust? Uh, the staff reported to us that many of the investigations were very short, they weren't detailed, that wasn't uh, a thorough investigation. Well, I have not asked the inspector general to do that. He's been asked by members of Congress to do some uh, investigations, but not specifically on that issue. Mm -hmm. Well, my time has expired. Uh, thank you very much thank for you. your testimony and your service. Thank you, gentlewoman from New York. And now, now I yield five minutes to the gentlewoman from Ohio, Ms. Captor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Mr. Secretary. You certainly have gotten into a lot of issues in your one-year tenure thus far. Um, let me ask you, um, can you speak to the level of cooperation uh, between Japan's counterpart of NISHTA and uh, NISHTA. Is their safety agency open and forthcoming, in your opinion, or does it suffer from the same kind of cloaked and opaque character of that country's Ministry of Trade? Are they working with you in sharing data on this recall issue? I think in some instances, yes. Um, so you're saying they've been cooperative in, in your tenure? In, in, oh, during my tenure, they've been cooperative. Uh huh. In some but instances, they have. In, but information regarding this acceleration pattern obviously wasn't shared 
from uh, by their ministry if they knew about it in Japan uh, versus our country. Our country, according to the data we've gotten from the Energy and Commerce Committee, first got a timeline in March 2004 uh, that on the Camry, Solara, and Lexus 300 models that um, Nishta found no pattern. Uh, and then there seems to be a gap between 2004 and 2007 in our country. Um, but in 2007, March, uh, Nishta opened an investigation on the Lexus ES350, uh, in which Nishta then found entrapment of the accelerator pedal, uh, pedal by floor mat um, as the sole cause uh, of what happened. And then through 2007, 2008, there were more and more uh, Toyota vehicles um, until the point in uh, January when Toyota suspended s sales of eight different models. And my question is, when all this was occurring uh, in our country, was Japan's ministry sharing information with you about recalls uh, prior to your tenure? Yeah, I'll have to check uh, Ms. Kaptur and, and put it on the record and get back to you on that. I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, one of the pieces of data I would like to place up on the boards here is the trade deficit the United States has amassed with Japan over the last 24 years in the area of automotive manufacturing, um, uh, autos and, and auto parts. And um, uh, one of the reasons that Toyota and some of the other companies have been able to gain a beachhead in global auto markets is that it operates from a very tightly protected home market. Uh, even while it's the second largest marketplace in the world, there is a chart that shows the trade deficits our country has amassed with Japan totaling over a trillion dollars, which translates into lost jobs in this country. Uh, less than 3 percent of Japan's marketplace is open to cars from anywhere else in the world. They didn't even take Yugos, uh, and they certainly don't take our auto parts in any appreciable number. Yet we've welcomed their cars here. Uh, our dealers sell their cars uh, in um, uh, that doesn't occur uh, in that country. Imagine the second largest marketplace in the world having less than 3 percent of their cars from any place else other than Japan, while our market, over half the cars come from elsewhere or from transplants here. And one of my questions of Mr. Toyota, and I have a hunch he's listening, is does this sort of predicament that the company now faces result from a rather attitude of market superiority resulting from the false confidence of a closed home market. In other words, you can afford to ignore uh, some of what is happening because of this false confidence that comes from that kind of a very uh, imbalanced situation. And um, I'm quite concerned about this. I have been for a long, long time. And uh, my question to you, and I would appreciate for the record going back and seeing what kind of uh, cooperation Japan's counterpart agency actually had with Nishta, uh, were there sudden acceleration difficulties inside of Japan, to your knowledge, during this period? I'll get you that for the record. Uh, because I think that's really important, uh, whether it's Canada, United States, what's happening inside Japan's market versus what's happening inside our marketplace, uh, the European marketplace. Uh, this is a very, very unlevel playing field. and. Um, uh, I'm, I'm quite concerned about the fact, uh, for the record, inside of Nishta, how many people from March 2004, which appears to be the first year in which some of these complaints started to come to Nishta, actually were involved in the assessment of what was happening inside of Nishta? A staff of 10, 20, 50? Uh, what were their backgrounds? How long had they worked for Nishta? And whom had they worked for before coming to Nishta? Are you able to provide that information for the record? We'll do the best we can. From your sense, how many people, is there anybody from Nishta there now that can tell us how large was the unit that assessed these, um, these recalls? Uh, we we'll, how many we'll people are you, we talking about? We want to be accurate about our information. We'll get it for the record. We'll, we'll hold the record open for the information. The gentlewoman's time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right. I now recognize the gentleman from Missouri, <laughs> Congressman Clay. Mr. Uh, Chairman, my staff has advised me that all of the questions that I wanted to ask have been asked. Uh, we have exhausted this issue with this witness, and I have no questions. Right. Thank, you. Thank you. No, no, you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, according to the record, I think that everyone. Did you have a? Uh, 
that everyone had an opportunity? I would, uh, I would uh, just yield to uh, Mr. Cummings for, for his question. Sure. Right. <laughs> You said something that really, I'm, I'm so glad I had the answer, chance to ask this. Who was, who was safety deaf? You said, you said somebody was safety deaf. Toyota. Toyota was safety deaf. And, in other words, and then you said that they, you said that there was a disc, some kind of disconnect. L l let me go back and tell you what I said. Yeah, because I want to be clear yeah. on that. Because yeah. Mr. Toyota, is, I'm going to yeah. ask him about Th what Mrs. you're saying. Mrs. Maloney asked me to assess what, what I think went wrong here. And I, two things. Toyota has an organization called North America Toyota. They have some great people there. They're very professional. They're good people. We work with them. They make recommendations to Japan. The decisions are made in Japan. The reason that our acting administrator went to Japan was because he didn't think his message was getting to Japan. Mm -hmm. So he flew over there and met with the Toyota people and said, look, this is serious. Lives are being lost. And when was that? Uh, November, December last year. OK. And right after that, they started taking action. So then I get on the phone with Mr. Toyota. And I said, this is a serious matter. This involves safety. It involves lives. That's and it. So my point is this. Their business model is they have a lot of good people in North America Toyota. But the decisions are made in Japan. Got you. All right. Thank you. That it, Mr. Chairman? Yeah, no, gentlemen. Uh, oh, one second. I was going to say, what well, a joy. Uh, the, uh, oh, no. The, yeah. the gentlelady from California, the, the of course. <laughs> Gentlewoman from California, Congress. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, um, for being here these many hours. I'm going to try and be quick and to the point. And I want to talk about the black boxes. Um, if 80 percent of the cars already have black boxes, and they help piece together um, what happens during the last five seconds of an accident. Uh, why not make them mandatory in all cars? Well, that, it's a good point, and it's been raised here earlier, and we're going to look at that. We really are. It's a, it's a good point, and if, if it's a way for us to really measure what happens, it's something we're going to look at. Now, as I understand it, you can read the black boxes from some of our domestic That's manufacturers, but you cannot read the black boxes from Toyota because they're encrypted. That's correct. So shouldn't we require that all black boxes be readable by NHTSA in yes. order to be able to, so you would support that? Yes. All right. Um, have you had a, a chance to look at Joan Claybrook's EDR recommendations? And if so, would you provide written responses? You mean her testimony here? Yes. I have not read her testimony. She also suggests that your office needs about $100 million more in terms of support. Would you support that recommendation? We're very grateful to the President included 66 new positions in our budget for 11. How many software engineers do you have working within the department? Software engineers, I'd have to get, I, I, we have, we like, we have 100, between 125, 130 engineers. I'll get you the figure on the software. All right, and you'll provide it to the committee of in course. a written response. Because what I've been told is while you do have many engineers, you don't have software engineers. We have electrical engineers. I know that was a point that people were a little confused about. But and I'll if this has already been um, asked, I apologize. But it appears that the, the, the chip you need in the computer system in these vehicles to have a brake override is really the solution. Do you concur? Well, uh, Mr. Lenz said yesterday at the Energy and Commerce Committee that they were installing brake override in many of their vehicles. I guess my question to you is, irrespective of what Toyota is doing, would you look at it to determine whether or not the requirement that, that the brake override be actually implemented and installed in more vehicles than we'll, Toyota? We'll be happy to look at it. And you'll let the committee know as well? Yes. Thank you. I'll give you back. Thank you. Thank you very much. And let me thank the Secretary for his time. And What a joy, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> it's great to be back. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. We, we're, we're now going to have a 10-minute recess, and then we will come back with the second panel. We're going to have a 10-minute recess, and we come forward with the second panel.
Mic check, test one, two. Mic check, test one, two, three. Mic check, test one, two. Mic check, test one, two, mic check, testing one, two, three, four, mic check. Mic check, test one, two, testing, testing. Mic check, test, test, test. Mic check, test one, two. Mic check, test one, two, three, four. Mic check, test one, two. Mic check, test one, two. 